Uh, our first speaker on the panel is Chris Walker. Uh, professor Walker is a professor at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Prior to joining the law faculty, he clerked for Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court. He is a member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, and he serves on the Governing Council of the American Bar Association's Section on Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. He's slated to soon become the chair of the section. Chris? I'm giving it up. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, so this last panel is all about judicial review. Um, and so I just kind of, and because I turn in my slides not on time, I think Leah decided to change the, uh, the logo. Um, <laughs> I will keep this forever because the game in a few weeks isn't going to be happy, Leah. I think you're going to have a really, really <laughs> tough time when your team comes to Columbus. But, uh, uh, but there's a lot we can talk about with judicial review and what could change when it comes to immigration. Uh, and I just want to kind of flag, I think, as a setup to say what I'm going to talk about is probably boring and not ambitious. Uh, but I do want to start us with some of these ambitious ones. Uh, and I think the big ambition we have right now uh, is the idea of getting rid of Chevron deference, or at least narrowing it in the context of immigration adjudication. Uh, and we'll have Mike or Professor Kagan in just a minute give us one version of that. Um, he has support uh, in this, uh, as was mentioned on earlier panels. Justice Gorsuch uh, in Gutierrez v v Brizuela versus Lynch, really, you know, the attack against Chevron grew out of immigration. Uh, and I think the attack on Chevron is strongest in the immigration context. I think it's also stronger in the adjudication context more generally than it is in rulemaking. And maybe we'll have time to talk about that I wanted to flag one other one, because I think there's some I irony here. Um, um, when Don McGahn, White House counsel, when he was White House counsel, he gave a speech at the Federal Society National Convention where he attacked Chenery, uh, in uh, which is the rule that in adjudication that you can make policies, right? It's a Supreme Court doctrine from the 1940s. Uh, and he gave this really, really detailed speech against the Chenery II doctrine, saying that they shouldn't be able to make generally applicable, applicable policies through adjudication and that they should not be retroactive as well, right? Um, now, maybe we can get into that more in the Q&A. Um, that's not something that Attorney General Barr or Attorney General Sessions has embraced. Uh, I think a lot that is actually quite unique to immigration is that so much of the policy is made through adjudication and through the Attorney General's referral authority. But that's another big ambitious project you could do. Uh, I hope someone writes that one up, because I think it's worth writing up in the immigration context. Now we're on to my stuff, not as ambitious. Uh, but I think it's really important. Uh, and I want to kind of just take a step back first. And I think it's very ambitious, so. You think it's ambitious? Yeah. Oh, well, um, OK. Uh, I want to take a step back and just, we, we heard at lunch today from the head of the Executive Office of Immigration Review about this process, and I think before I kind of get into my, my argument, and my argument is that courts, when they're reviewing cases that come up from uh, the Board of Immigration Appeals, that they shouldn't just be thinking about the case before them, uh, because they're only seeing an unrepresentative sample of an ice, you know, the tip of an iceberg, and they really should be thinking much more about how they as judges can interact with the system more generally. That's kind of my, my, my kind of big argument in this, in this paper. Uh, but to get there, you have to understand a little bit more about the immigration adjudication system. And I'm just going to give you a few data points on this. Uh, right now, we have 400, about 450 immigration judges with a hun almost 100 new immigration judges this year alone. And then we have about 18 to 21 members of the Board of Immigration Appeals that review the immigration judges' decisions. To date, in 2019, I just pulled these off the website that for, as of last month, uh, they have over 400,000 new cases, and they've already completed 275,000 cases. So imagine that 450 judges deciding, probably by the end of the year, over 400,000 cases uh, uh, in, in their docket. Now, as we know from prior research, uh, including ones that have referred to this as the refugee roulette, the system is not fair. Immigration system is not a system that creates consistent results, like individuals are not treated the same. And one of the reasons why that we know this from the Ingrid and Schaefer um, study is that two in five 
uh, immigrants that are ex navigating the system have no legal representation at the hearing. Um, immigrants with lawyers win about 21% of the time in their data set. Those without lawyers win about 2% of the time. When they try to control for how, for similarly situated immigrants, because you might say, well, these are different, maybe there's a selection effect, those that have lawyers. Uh, when they try to control for that, um, it's 15 times greater chance uh, that the, immig the immigrants that are represented by lawyers even seek the relief, uh, and a 5.5 greater chance that they receive it when they have lawyers when they don't. So a big part of this problem is perhaps that we don't have legal representation there. Uh, if you look at another study, um, the Hausman study that came out the year later, uh, this one is, and I think I just ruined your other slide. Oh, there we go. Um, this one is even, I think, even more concerning. If what you care about in an adjudication system is fair and consistent results, where like people are treated similarly by different judges, um, they find that um, more than half of uh, the represented, those that have legal representation seek appeals to the Board of Immigration Appeals, whereas only 3% of those that don't. And you should really go read Dave's study finds great disparities in outcomes among immigration judges after controlling for a number of different factors and trying to identify similar cases. And he finds that the Board of Immigration Appeals uh, and the Federal Court Review doesn't help too much. So this kind of paints a story of a system uh, where there's a lot of adjudications that aren't consistent, right, across adjudicators. Uh, and, 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 and I think that should be a problem. Now, getting kind of more to my argument, uh, if you look at, if you just compare, and I'm using kind of estimates from the last 10 years, it's actually been quite constant in the federal courts, circuit courts. They hear, they decide about 5,000 uh, petitions for review from the Board of Immigration Appeals per year. And I just threw up the 275,000 number. I think that's actually where the, the immigration courts have been at before this year pretty regularly. And you see, just looking at the stark difference, that the... The, the circuit courts aren't really reviewing much, right? They don't get to see that big of a sample of the cases that are going through the immigration courts. And so my argument is that they should be thinking about their role differently, they being the circuit courts that have exclusive jurisdiction over this, uh, in light of the fact that they don't see that many of them. Now, where I start with this argument is getting back to that Chenery decision, but a different holding from it. Uh, in the Chenery decisions, one of the key holdings was that when an agency gets something wrong, the court's role is not to decide that question itself, but to remand that issue back to the agency to allow the agency to decide it again. Now, this rule, uh, in the immigration context, we kind of have a trilogy of cases from the 2000s where the Supreme Court goes through and really, really hammers home this rule. Um, first, in Ventura, they say, for questions of fact, that's not for us to decide, send it back to the agency. In Gonzalez versus Thomas, they say even mixed questions of facts and law, not for us to decide, send it back to the agency. And then in Negussi, at least in the Chevron context, uh, you have the Supreme Court saying, again, we remand these cases back to the agency. Now, this is something that's really frustrating uh, for circuit court judges, especially in the immigration context, because in a lot of cases, the answer is very obvious that the petitioner is entitled to some type of relief uh, from removal or that the, 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 the agency won't be able to do something differently on remand, and yet the Supreme Court repeatedly, in a number of cases, sent this message home. You've really got to send these back because that's administrative law 101. Um, so what I did a few years back is I went and tried to get a sense of how these cases played out uh, in the circuit courts uh, and to get a sense of is the remand rule followed. Uh, and it turns out that Generally, I mean, although there's some pretty big variation among circuits, the remand rule is followed uh, about 80% of the time. There are a few cases where the court doesn't remand. Um, your kind of biggest offenders are the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, which also tend to be the ones that hear a lot of immigration cases. And if you read a lot of these cases, it's, they're pretty, pretty upset with how these immigration judges are acting and don't want to send cases back to them. That's kind of one feel you get from this. Uh, but generally, they follow this rule. Now, when I did this, though, one interesting thing that kind of emerged is that when courts did remand these cases to the agency, um, they used a number of different tools 
what I kind of call to enhance the dialogue with the agency on remand. They might require the agency to report back and provide notice of what the ultimate outcome was. The panel may decide to retain that case. In other words, say, we really care about this. You get it right, and we're going to get it back if you don't get it right. Um, they may try to put time limits on the case, and we can talk about whether that's actually allowed under administrative law, but they do it, and the agency does comply, or at least they don't challenge whether the court can do it. One of the core things they do is they provide hypothetical solutions. They'll have a concurrence or some dicta and opinion where they explain what they think that the agency should be doing or thinking about on remand. They oftentimes certify certain issues uh, that the agency should focus on, maybe the only issues the agency can decide. Um, you'll see cases where they seek concessions from the government uh, at oral argument or supplemental briefing to try to narrow the issues of the remand, to narrow, it, narrow the dialogue or the conversation on remand. Some would suggest or even order that it be assigned to a different judge. The order part is clearly not allowed under administrative law unless there is a constitutional due process issue. Um, but the suggestion is something that they can use to try to change who they're speaking to at the agency. The other ones weren't found and they were added a few more. Uh, preliminary injunctive relief might be an issue, especially for individuals that are detained. Um, escalating the issue within the executive. I can talk more about that later if we want in the Q&A or with Congress or other ways that you can kind of engage with this dialogue. Uh, when I wrote this paper, I was just trying to kind of explore it and not really go into it. But in this project, the kind of bigger question is, is there really a dialogue going on uh, at the agency level? Or is it just the court screaming at the agencies to do something different? And so what I did is I went and back and FOIA'd all of the decisions that were, all these 239 decisions that were remanded back to the agency, and it took, you know, the agency about three or four years to give me the decisions, and of course they were highly redacted, and so we had to kind of guess a little bit when we were matching them, and I'm still not done matching all of them. But just to give you a sense of how this works out, on the cases that were sent back to the agency, the non-citizen um, won outright in 97 of the 213, and they lost outright in 46. The other ones had mixed outcomes where they might have sent it back to the immigration judge. We don't know yet what happened. Uh, or they might have, it's just harder to kind of tell. Um, interestingly, nine out of 10 had uh, legal counsel on remand. Uh, and eight out of 10, and if you look at the decisions, they're actually engaging with the circuit court precedent. Um, why does this matter? Um, again, uh, uh, if what we care about are the non-citizens that are similarly situated that should be entitled to relief but didn't have the wherewithal to work their way through the process or the lawyer representation to help them make the claims in a way that an immigration judge could digest and understand. Um, a court interacting with the agency to try to encourage the agency to address more systemic problems in the system is going to have a much greater effect. Since we already have to remand these cases under administrative law principles, it's really worth courts thinking about how they can recalibrate how they do this uh, in order to try to help an agency or try, try to help the attorney general that has the authority over that agency or try to help Congress who has oversight authority of that agency to understand what's not going right in the process to try to get more consistent outcomes along the way. I'm going to take another minute, Adam, and just kind of say the big negative that I want to get on the table is time. One reason I got interested in this project that I was clerking at the court uh, when Nagusi was decided, that last case in, this, in, in, in the cycle. Um, last year, I did a quick blog post about the case on notice and comment and said, hey, we finally have a decision from the Board of Immigration Appeals nine years later uh, from the Supreme Court, right? And that's not when the case began. I think the case began uh, in 2004 uh, and it's a case that a non-citizen has been waiting for an answer for since 2004 and got a preliminary answer from the Board of Immigration Appeals just last year. I actually don't know where it's at now. We don't necessarily find that out until it gets back to court. Uh, but there is that issue of time, right? And I'll admit that the delay of a remand and dialogue is, is, is problematic. I'm not sure at the end of the day if we did the kind of the cusp of analysis whether that delay for a non-detained non-citizen is the cost of that outweigh the benefits of hopefully other non-citizens benefiting from 
that dialogue and that interaction, the ones that wouldn't necessarily be able to seek just for you to start with. So my kind of more modest, less ambitious approach, if we're going to rethink judicial review, the fortunate thing is that it doesn't require a Supreme Court decision or a new statute. It just requires circuit judges to be more cognizant of the fact that the case they have before them is just the tip of the iceberg and that they have an opportunity to interact with that agency to encourage better adjudication and more consistent outcomes um, uh, within the agency at the agency level. So I think I'll just stop there. Great. Thanks, Chris. And by the way, uh, Professor Walker has co-authored and, uh, authored and co-authored a number of groundbreaking studies on judicial review of agency action and lawmaking. Uh, so I encourage you to look those up. His paper for this uh, conference is titled Recalibrating Judicial Review in Immigration Adjudication. And as Andrew mentioned, like all of our papers, it's available on our website. The other paper we're discussing this panel is titled Chevron's Asylum, Reassessing Deference in Refugee Cases. And it's authored by our second speaker, Professor Michael Kagan. Uh, Michael is the Joyce Mack Professor of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He directs the school's immigration clinic. He teaches administrative law, professional responsibility, international human rights, and immigration. Through his research and his studies, uh, he focuses on the tension between immigration law and civil rights. Mike. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and I really want to thank Adam and the Center for organizing this uh, conference uh, and the workshop before, which have been really helpful to me. Um, and uh, since I do come from UNLV, let me extend to you hearty Nevada Day greetings. Um, I'm sure you're all observing. Um, so uh, we're, supposed, is, we're sorry for taking you away from the festive, uh, the festivities. Yes, exactly. So I it's, Nevada Day was always on Halloween. No, it was October 31st, uh, 1864, when Nevada became a state. But it's celebrated. Actually, I don't know why it's celebrated today, but it just is. That's our to next. That's our that next fact. conference. Yeah. All right, let me go. Um, I, I really like. Uh, um, Chris's uh, in, um, introduction to this, although I didn't know he was going to steal that picture of me and the slides, uh, we'll have to talk about that. Um, the, uh, um, but the Chevron, as it applies in immigration, really does actually scramble the usual politics as it's understood about Chevron, that now, you know, whether you're for or against Chevron becomes this big issue in judicial nominations between Democrats and Republicans. And I, I have hoped in vain, and Chris and I have talked about this before, I'm not the only one to have observed the fact that um, these things play out differently in immigration, and I have this uh, crazy hope that this might be a way in which there could be some bridge between left and right on Chevron. That has not really, that bridge has not been built yet, I think. Um, but uh, in any case, um, if you want to look at the black letter rule, what the Supreme Court has said, Chevron applies in immigration cases, period. That's what the Supreme Court has said in very broad terms. And there is a, probably a plausible, very good argument, actually, that my presentation should just stop with that, and that will be the end of my paper. However, I'm not stopping, so uh, just bear, but bear that in mind. I think I should make that clear from the beginning, and I'll come back to it. Um, if you look at what the Supreme Court actually does in the very wide range of immigration cases it takes, it does not actually treat Chevron the same in all immigration cases uh, at all. Um, and that is because I think not all immigration cases raise the same kinds of issues. Um, so in my previous paper uh, in Iowa Law Review, um, which I called Chevron's Liberty Exception, I looked at cases on grounds of removability and detention. And in those areas, uh, the Supreme Court uh, tends to just ignore Chevron. And uh, when if it even, it does not even always mention Chevron, um, even when the parties argue for it uh, strenuously, and even when um, the government asks for Chevron deference. And if the, if the Supreme Court discusses Chevron in these cases, it seems to give it no weight. So examples of this, there's actually a long list in my uh, article, but for example, on grounds of removability, Torres, um, is a criminal ground of removability case. The government strenuously asked for Chevron. The Supreme Court uh, ignored Chevron in its decision. And on detention, Priyap v. Nielsen, um, the government strenuously asked for Chevron. The parties debated whether it should apply. And then the, the, both the, it was a 5-4 decision, and both majority and dissent ignored it. If you had only those decisions, you wouldn't even know there is such a thing called Chevron. Um, and even in the ones, as I said, where it's mentioned in that, th that area of law, um, it seems to carry no weight in the decision. But there are other immigration cases where Chevron is not just mentioned, but does real work and uh, really may determine the outcome. Um, so those include visa eligibility, uh, that uh, 
Cuello de Osorio is a, a case like that. Chevron is key in that case to its outcome. Um, and asylum, which is what I'm focusing on. In fact, the most quoted uh, statement from the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court says Chevron applies in immigration cases comes from Aguirre Aguirre. That's the standard go-to citation for uh, the Department of Justice in arguing for Chevron. And uh, that is an asylum case. Um, now, uh, I'm going to focus, there's a whole lot going on in asylum law now, and there always is a lot going on in asylum law, but I'm going to focus especially on a very key area of litigation right now, uh, and for the last few years, uh, the definition of what's known as particular social group. A very quick background, um, this is what uh, probably the most litigated area of asylum eligibility. Um, uh, it is, you have to have a well-founded fear of persecution to be eligible for asylum, but that is not enough. It has to be persecution on account of one of five reasons. Um, particular social group is essentially the least defined category, and gender-based claims go in, uh, have to be put into that category. It's very important for people fleeing from Central America right now, people fleeing from gang violence, um, usually getting argued over whether or not they can claim to be persecuted on account of particular social group. The result of these, area, these cases is extremely high stakes because um, this matters when everyone agrees this person would be very seriously harmed. So in my paper, I cite an 11th, a recent 11th Circuit case where the government agreed that um, the claimant had been kidnapped and raped and that this might happen again, but asylum was still denied because she could not cite uh, a protected ground, a particular social group problem. So the stakes, the human stakes in these cases are very high. And um, the, uh, at the circuit court level, Chevron has been key. So in one area of immigration law, Chevron seems to be essentially irrelevant. And in another area, though, it seems to be at the height of its powers. Now, I argue, actually, that there's a, there are normative explanations for, the, for this distinction, that this is an inconsistency that actually follows a, a pattern. Um, on the remove, grounds of removability and uh, detention, that these cases touch on physical liberty. Uh, where the separation of powers concerns are particularly heightened. Um, uh, also, they tend to have a close nexus to criminal law. Um, Judge Sutton ha is probably the leading proponent of a very uh, rigorous form of that, which I don't think actually quite works, but I think there is a generally close nexus in these cases um, with, uh, with criminal law. Asylum cases, by contrast, and also visa eligibility, there's a much closer nexus to foreign affairs. Um, than there is on the grounds of removability cases. They literally, these cases, the factual substance is literally about things happening in a foreign country uh, or a person who is physically in a foreign country. Um, I do think we have to flag that a little bit because of something um, that, uh, that Chris mentioned, which is that adjudication is an odd mechanism by which to set foreign affairs or foreign policy. Uh, but, but that at least is a, 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 I think a plausible and coherent argument for nexus. I think probably the most important, and the one that I'll get to of normative question, is political accountability. That this is a reason, leave this, uh, um, the, interpretation, the interpretation of this uh, ambiguous statutory phrase um, is a pretty grave question of policy, so leave it to the political branches. Uh, that uh, is often an argument for a judicial deference, and I think it may uh, work here, but it's also one that probably, to borrow from the previous panel, deserves a hard look. Um, so um, there are a lot of critics of asylum, of deference in asylum and refugee cases. Um, one argument that's out there, which I think has validity in a certain way, is the fact that um, the Supreme Court has acknowledged that refugee law is very strong links to international law. Um, so it's not a normal case of, of statutory interpretation. Um, I think that's very important and valid so far as it goes, but I think that probably can be dealt with within the Chevron framework. You could, that's a charming Betsy doctrine in terms of in, how to interpret statutes, but I think one could probably fit that into a Chevron step one or maybe even step two. Uh, I don't know that that actually really resolves the question um, uh, of whether or not Chevron should apply. Um, but there's a really big question uh, of whether Chevron apl should apply in adjudication. Now, th um, recently, the Trump administration has um, uh, implemented several extremely important rules by regulation on asylum, which I probably, David pointed this out to me earlier, and I think I probably need to look more at those um, uh, to, 
but most of our litigation over the eligibility for asylum is done through adjudication. The cases that, um, that Chris is referring to, uh, which percolate up through uh, petitions for review of orders of removal, usually from the BIA. But now we get to, I think, what has happened recently. Um, in asylum cases, Chevron has become really central. And this is actually not new with this current administration. Um, the Board of Immigration Appeals began tinkering with its definition of a particular so social group during the Obama administration. And it went back and forth. Actually, there was quite a bit of dialogue, uh, which I trace in my paper, between the circuit courts, which did not really like the BIA's first draft versions and, and sent those back. Um, and finally, the, the, the BIA's final definition of a particular social group, which I won't bore you with because this is not an immigration law class, was finally approved, but a bit grudgingly, uh, particularly by the Third Circuit, which I think made particularly clear that we really liked your old version better but this is within the realm of reasonable interpretations. That's a, the SERL uh, decision. There's a Ninth Circuit version of that. Several circuits have, have reached that. Now, in the current administration and what's going on now, um, which, I, which I think actually will really push and will get be probably in a, within a few years see where the limits might be of Chevron deference in this area. We have had one of the important patterns in adjudication and immigration is a much more aggressive involvement of the attorney general, uh, not just the BIA. Um, so Trump's attorney generals have issued two really big uh, asylum decisions, matter of AB and matter of LEA, um, which limit the uh, uh, eligibility for asylum. Um, and matter of LEA in particular, which has to do with family-based persecution, explicitly goes against a pretty wide, uh, broad, broadly developed area of circuit case law. Uh, and it relies ex uh, explicitly on brand X. So the attorney general really is pushing uh, uh, as far as he can go uh, on, um, on Chevron deference, and we will see if the courts let him. What's also very important, I mentioned um, political accountability is possibly an argument uh, in favor of deference here. Um, but it, it is actually a good normative question to ask, and I really don't actually know the answer to this, and I'm not sure it can have an objective answer. It's politicization of the interpretation of a high-stakes statute, a virtue or a vice. Um, both uh, Vice President Biden and Senator Warren have called for reversing uh, one or both of uh, these uh, decisions by the uh, Attorney General on asylum eligibility. So you can literally say this is on the ballot. And if political accountability is good, then actually that's great, right? Like the voters get a say in this. Uh, and that is a pretty good argument in a democracy. I do want to point out, and actually I really like, uh, I'm going to probably add to my paper, I think, was it Federalist 62? Yeah. Um, that the, the downside of political accountability is instability. Right, that the law, even though Congress hasn't changed the def won't necessarily change the definition of who should be able to get asylum, that the actual application of that statute to tens of thousands of people may change based on who won the last election. Um, and that leads to instability in the law. It also means because of the backlogs in the court, and I, since I uh, handle the clinic, uh, w my clients, cases we are filing today. I literally really don't know what the law is going to be on these cases three, four years from now when we actually get it in front of a judge. Uh, and that's not because it's a uh, new area of law, it's actually an old area of law, but the one that keeps switching back and forth. And so there's a, there's a, in addition to the question of whether Chevron should apply in adjudication, there's a big normative debate going on in immigration of whether politi politicization is a good thing, and uh, in especially in adjudication and application of a statute like this. So I will end with that, and I look forward to a good discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much. Our third speaker today, our last speaker of the day, is David Rubenstein. David is professor of law at Washburn, Washburn University School of Law, where he teaches constitutional law, administrative law, legislation, and professional responsibility. He directs the Robert J. Dole Center for Law and Government, and he is editor-in-chief of the administrative, or sorry, of the ABA's administrative law sections publication, uh, administrative and regulatory law news. If you're a member of the ABA's ad law section and uh, you're enjoying the new and improved uh, journal, uh, you have David to thank. <laughs>
David uh, served for three years as an assistant U.S. attorney at the Southern District of New York, where he specialized in immigration. David, thanks for joining us. Thank you, and thank, uh, thank you so much for having me. This is a great honor to be here. Um, so I'll talk about, I'm just, I'm just reflecting oh, David, on could you use the, not, yeah, you use the, the microphone to your left. I think the other one had some problems before. This one here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is that there, better? That's better. Okay, let me just move it closer. So I, don't, I did not write, write a paper, wasn't asked to write a paper, but I was asked to come and discuss and comment on the papers I read, and I loved both of them. I'm going to start with Chris's, just because you went first, and that's where I'll start. <coughs> um, and I want to explain why I think it is actually quite an ambitious project that you're working on. Um, and I think it's key to understand that what Chris is getting at here is, is not just the dialogic value that could come in a particular case on a remand, but that, um, that the dialogue in the remand could have systemic effects in the sense that a court, through engaging in one of these dialogic tools, can affect change in cases that are not before the court that may never come before the court, given the disparities in representation and so on and so forth. And, and to my mind, that's a very ambitious normative claim, first of all, that courts should be doing this in the first place. But the real uh, ambition is to suggest that the data that you have or that's even collectible could demonstrate that dialogue in individual cases could have systemic effects. And that's, the, that's sort of my first point that I want to focus on right now. It really takes a, a theoretical, uh, logical leap to say that just because a court can engage in dialogue with um, impact and, and positive effect on errors on a case-by-case -case basis that it would have systemic level changes, but systems theory teaches otherwise. You know, the idea behind systems theory it, 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 when you're dealing with a complex system is that when you have individual parts, individual inputs, and in this case that would translate into individual decisions by judges, when you put it into a system that it's going to have linear results, that it's going to have, you know, the, the results that you would expect based on what you see in individual cases. Uh, and the whole idea behind systems theory is that the system responds in ways and that you know you put something in, but what you get out looks different than what you put in, and you get all these unintended consequences. And especially when you're working with a theory that's based on a dynamic system, right? The whole idea is that the courts can change the system. I, I do think you have to take, uh, or maybe want to take account more for the fact that even if we're seeing positive effects in individual cases, proving through data or, or the data that you have that this could actually have a systemic effect is a very ambitious project. And I'm not sure that that data exists and what you have. If it does, you should be looking for that, especially, I think. And whether or not that, <coughs> how you would even collect that data if it didn't already exist in the data that you had. Um, and, and one of the examples, I think, Chris, you said yourself in, in, in discussion yesterday, just an example of an unintended consequence. You know, if you, if you have a court remanding with a time frame to get back, um, that might actually achieve the purpose of getting the decision back from the agency, but it could skew the priorities at the agency level about which the order in which that they're dealing with cases. And, and perhaps by giving priority because a court isn't thinking about it to a particular case, maybe the agency is unable to get to someone who's in detention as opposed to someone who's not in detention who's now getting priority because the court decided that that was going to be one of the di dialogic tools is to, to sort of put a time limit on. Um, my second point is related is that uh, I think the paper does an excellent job of, exp of sort of really laying out how the remands and the dialogic tools really come in three flavors. Number one, you can have a remand for facts, you know, you could have a remand for questions of law, and you could have remands for mixed questions of law and fact. And so if you think about the different types of remands on the one hand, and on the other hand, you think about the different types of systemic problems or the systemic errors at the agency. So you could have systemic errors of fact. You could have systemic errors of law, and you could have systemic mixed questions of fact and law. And one of the things that I, I, may, I didn't see in the paper, and I wonder if you want to uh, sort of make those connections, is w whether or not or to what extent we can hope or expect that a remand using your dialogic tools in a, in a remand based on facts would have spillover effects in other cases involving different types of factual patterns. So you, like even to have spillovers within systemic factual problems in terms of the agency, but even more so, like, if there's a remand based on errors in fact, could that or would that have an effect on how the agency handles or maybe uh, gives more attention and avoids errors of law, right? And so when you're, that's the whole challenge is when you're talking about systemic effects, you have to have those spillover effects. 
And how to track those is complicated because you're dealing with three different dimensions, with fact, with law, and mixed questions of fact and law. And I think that um, your models maybe should be more sensitive to those distinctions and to be able to track it perhaps through the data. And, it, and it's more complicated still because even within facts, you could have different levels of fact. You could have micro, re remands from micro facts, I'll call them, where the agency maybe missed a particular fact that would apply in that particular case, or the agency might not be giving credence to country conditions, right, which is a question of fact, but it's a type of question of fact that it could apply in more than just the case that's been remanded. And the same thing for questions of law. You could have a remand on a question of law, but it might just involve a particular phrase in a particular statute. And so to what extent can, a, can sort of the dialogic value of the remand for that particular statute spill over to other questions of law? So, it, it, so you have those extra level of complications. Um, another complication is that at the, I think, at least when I was practicing at the BIA, there's, the BIA is only going to honor um, decisions in the circuit for which the appeal is going to go. So let's say that the agency gets the message from the court, from the nice circuit, to, right, to what extent is that message going to then apply to decisions that are then going to be sent to the first circuit, to the second circuit? So you have this built-in structural hindrance to the whole spillovers that you're hoping to accomplish in remands. And, and, and by the way, it would apply to any agency that, that employs that type of acquiescence policy, which, which is circuit by circuit. And so to the extent that you want to extend this um, idea to outside the immigration context, it's also something you might want to think about. Um, the third point, I, uh, the third point I want to make, and I think the last major point here, um, is that you you talk about this being a two-way dialogue, and in fact, it can't be a quote-unquote dialogue by definition if it's not two-way. And I love the the table, which I know is from prior work, about the different toolbox that courts use. But what's the toolbox for agencies? Yeah. You know, so what are the dialogic tools that agencies have when they're responding to the court? Um, what if there are systemic errors at the judicial level? What messages can the agency send to the court to let the court know that the court's overstepping in their remands and that actually it's the court that's making mistakes? And so e is something even like delay or dragging the agency's feet, is that something we could call a tool that the agency might use as part of the dialogue with the court? Anyway, I'm sure you could come up with a really fascinating, since you have the cases where the agency is talking back to the court, maybe you could categorize them into a toolbox like you've done for, for, the, for the court. I think it'd be really interesting. Um, OK. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, one other point is that I wonder how your model might account for dial, I don't know, I have a name for it, but dialogue intermediaries. And so I was at the US Attorney's Office, and in my role there, I think I, it was, it was sort of 2003 eras after the um, Ashcroft administration went to a, a, a basically a, a one BIA member rubber stamp in some ways of to clear the backlog at the BIA, which resulted in a backlog at the circuit courts all over the country, but especially in the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit. And as a U, assistant U.S. attorney, I was operating in the Second Circuit, and it was triage. And I, I think I literally maybe briefed one out of every ten cases on my docket because there was just too much to do. So we would look for cases like we should, we should try to settle this, remand this back to the agency before it even went to the court. And so one of the things that I was thinking about is when the court engages in, in this dialogue and using these tools, they're not just talking to the agency, but they could be talking to <coughs> sort of a, 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 an intermediary like the government lawyers. Who, who are looking at those cases and saying, I've seen, I don't want to lose, we don't want to publish decision on this point, let's remand it, and that could actually create, uh, in terms of a systemic effect, it could even be more valuable uh, if the messaging is going maybe yeah. indirectly to those intermediaries that are helping the agency make judgment calls about how to resolve cases, especially in a situation where you have so many backlog cases where things like triage and kicking the can down the road are, are maybe not uh, ideal, but it is, as a practical matter, a lot of, I think, what is happening at the agency level when they're faced with all these cases and then all these remands to the extent they're um, receiving these remands from the courts. Um, okay, so let me talk to you about Michael's paper, which again, loved it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I understand your paper to be you know, partly descriptive and then partly normative, right? So the, the descriptive part is to, is to build on your prior work, uh, and your prior work, the descriptive claim was that the courts are not applying Chevron deference in the detention and deportation issues. Um, but I, as you recognize yourself, that descriptive claim is, you, you don't have the smoking gun for that. You don't have a court saying, 
certainly not the Supreme Court saying, we're not applying Chevron deference here because it involves detention. Right. What you have instead are these soft indicators where you know, the court is either uh, making passing reference at Chevron deference, but then uh, maybe engaging in interpretive gymnastics to decide the case at step one. And, and you'll be looking at that case, you say, well, that's a, a data point, which if it was a loan, you'd let it pass, but you have enough data points that you could say that it looks like there's something that, that's a pattern here. Right? And so your, your whole descriptive claim with regard to the detention and the deportability um, cases is, is, is it's, it, I think it's defensible. I'm just saying, I think, and you would admit that it's, it, it's based on soft evidence. You know, and certainly when you compare it to what you have in the asylum context, where you have cases very explicitly saying, we're applying Chevron, and, and as you said yourself, that's making a difference uh, in these cases. But I wanna, I wanna offer some, some alternative accounts that might explain you know, why, given that you don't have the smoking gun in the other cases, some other descriptive uh, or possibilities why um, we're not seeing Chevron deference in the, in the detention cases, because I think that'll relate back to the asylum. Um, it's first of all, it, it could be just be a, a, um, a feature of the clarity of the statutes at issue. Right, so that when you're dealing with asylum and you're, and you're trying to interpret the word uh, particular social group, I mean, that's ambiguous. I mean, that is a classic example of ambiguity. Whereas if you're looking at a uh, detention statute, you're gonna have maybe, uh, arguably have a lot more to work with. And so in terms of finding clarity in the statute at step one. And so I'm not suggesting that courts are not engaging in interpretive gymnastics at step one. Um, I'm just suggesting that at least in the asylum context, it's gonna almost, m many more situations where it will just be ambiguous, you're gonna see Chevron a lot more. Whereas in other contexts, the court may not be making a, a distinction because it's involving liberty interest as you claim or something else, but simply be by virtue of the clarity uh, or relative cl clarity of the statutes at issue. Um, an interesting thing to think about also, if you, if you look more at the more recent cases, why you might not see mention of Chevron deference, and it, is that it's a, it's a can of worms today, right? And so if a court can avoid you know, bringing Chevron into it by simply deciding a case at step one, then that's a reason why the court might not cite or re rely on Chevron, which is completely independent of the concern for liberty interests and so on and so forth. So in other words, it, it's something that's I think new is that you could see the court avoiding Chevron um, for, as an institutional matter because they don't want to engage in that dialogue or that debate in the context of a case where they could otherwise agree or disagree on the clarity of the statute, for example. I, 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 tying, like, I wanted to just begin to tie some of the papers together and, 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 and Chris teed this up, but I think it's more central in your paper, Mike, but I think the discussion, I think we should all circle back to it because I think it's super interesting, is you know, how does political accountability factor in? Um, should we be making distinctions for Chevron deference between adjudication and rulemaking and so on? So that whole uh, suite of questions I think is super interesting and really important. Um, with regard to the, the way you teed up in the paper, as I understand it, you, you're, you're seeing that there's a tension here because on the one hand, political accountability is a putative rationale behind Chevron deference, but on the other hand, in the context of adjudication, we don't necessarily want adjudication to be decided on political grounds. It raises due process concerns and so on and so forth. And um, I'm wondering if that really is a, if that's a false tension in some ways in, in this respect. I mean. Me, the Mead line of cases makes clear that political accountability is not the sort of rationale or not the doctrinal rationale behind Chevron deference. Uh, and in fact, you know, the court gives deference to independent agencies, for example. I mean, even though in Chevron itself the court alludes to political accountability, there's never been, as far as I know, an, a, a doctrinal reason to give or not give deference. And so, for, at least on doctrinal grounds, there really isn't a tension there. Right, because Chevron doesn't, doesn't really look to political accountability as a reason or not to apply Chevron at all, at least as I understand it. Um, it still doesn't mean that it's not an interesting thing to consider. Um, let's, if, if we assume that um, political accountability is something that we want to avoid in adjudication, I also think that a distinction should be made between um, political interference with um, adjudications that are simply applying pre-existing law to fact, which is your typical adjudication, and adjudications that are creating policy making, which is what's implicating the Chenery II doctrine. Right? So if, if what you're concerned about is uh, political interference with adjudications where the agency is making policy, well then, then you're gonna have to sort of make another dichotomy because then why, right, 
why should we be worried about um, political interference with the policymaking part in adjudication, but not be worried about political sort of influence for policymaking and rulemaking? Right. And so at the end of the day, like we're, we're, we're splitting the, the atom of uh, Chevron in many different ways. And I think that it's, it's really, I think, really fascinating and useful to think through whether or not we should be drawing those distinctions in the first place and why. Let's, uh, let's stick with that last point first, because it's one of the points I was going to raise during mm -hmm. questions is, and just in a very big, big, you know, at a very high level, Thank what you. is the right way to think about whether you call it politics, policy judgment, value judgments, these non-factual um, considerations? How should we think about them in the context of, of what the agency is adjudicating and then how the courts are reviewing their work? Is this a place where we want yeah, to keep that out or, or not? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Well, I, I think um, actually I really appreciate your 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 comments. I think they're they are spot on in terms of the rationales that are given for Chevron. And I should notice actually note another reason for uh, for deference here is that Congress did say so. Uh, that that Congress in the mm -hmm. statute says that questions of law will be decided by the Attorney General. That's in the that's not the exact words, but that's basically that's in the statute. Um, the, uh, I think in, in immigration adjudication, uh, I do think the political accountability idea, even if it's not what the court has relied on, is very much in the spotlight right now because um, there's always been criticism of EOIR and the immigration court and the BIA, but it's particularly heightened now because of the interventions of the attorney general. Um, but it's, it's a big normative question about, well, why is it bad, if it is bad, to, for the attorney general to... Uh, to intervene. There is a school of thought and a good deal of literature that sort of implicitly assumes that the more the BIA and immigration court looked like regular courts without any political appointee interfering with them, the better, and then they might be presumably owed more respect, and the more the attorney general seems to be carrying out an administration's policy agenda, th that's worse, but it's actually a big normative question. Actually, there's a good argument that maybe that's better, actually, uh, because then if you don't like it, you can just change it with the next president. That's actually for people who don't like, you know, Sessions and Barr's decisions, this, the salvation might be there's going to be a new attorney general in the future after the next election and just change the president, you get a new attorney general. Uh, whereas actually the way the BIA traditionally operated, even when you would change the party of the president, the BIA just kind of kept going forward and it was sort of the same doctrine from Republican to Democrat back to Republican administration. That actually was the general norm, and then there is not much dialogue with the public. Um, so that is a, nor a big normative question. I think it's spotlighted in the public debate about mm -hmm. immigration adjudication right now. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm probably in the camp of political accountability being a really important, one of the important factors why we have Chevron deference uh, in addition to agency expertise and deliberative process. We're, it gets tricky, and I think, you know, Aaron Nelson and Kristen Hickman, did they do this paper for the center? It's hard to keep track of them. No, so they, they, no have they a, didn't. They have a paper that's not public yet, but coming out soon, where it really says we should just get rid of Chevron deference entirely in adjudication. And they walk through some of the main arguments, that this isn't a deliberative process, it doesn't have the public comment, it doesn't have the indicia of congressional intent to delegate that type of authority, and so let's kind of start there. And I think that's one issue here that I find really interested in the immigration adjudication context is you do have the attorney general ultimately having a final say. And while it hasn't been used a lot by attorney generals, every attorney general I think has used it, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, to kind of correct where the agency is going. Um, the problem is that the process by which it's done is not the type of deliberative process that a rulemaking would have, right? And I think that's that's the issue for me is, ultimately, I think the political accountability is really important, um, but it's it's not going through the notice and comment process where if you're gonna be making policy, and I'm already uncomfortable when it's not Congress making the policy, mm -hmm. but it's an agency, um, that the agency needs to have that type of process that really gets that all the public comment and get everyone to kind of weigh in on that. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of, I think the issue that you might might have there mm. with, with that. Uh, another issue that's lurking in the background here with adjudication, which Kristen and Aaron don't focus too much on, is the question of whether agencies should be adjudicating 
at all, right? And maybe that doesn't come up yet as much in immigration as it does with respect to the SEC or other types of agencies that are adjudicating private rights or that can impose civil penalties. Um, but I do think that there are issues with policymaking in those adjudications, mm -hmm. uh, especially policymaking where there's deference as well. Uh, and, and your first paper, I think, sets the foundation for expanding that uh, if it's a liberty exception, also in immigration and other contexts. But you see the court struggling with this already. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you read Justice Gorsuch's dissent in the patent case, uh, you really get this idea that, you know, why are these, these agencies, you know, judging these important issues? Why shouldn't we have tenure-protected judges mm -hmm. in Article Three doing that? So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that, that Federal 62 that I quoted earlier, that's from one of Gorsuch's Tenth Circuit opinions involving, I think, deference. If I can't remember if it was Brizuela mm -hmm. or De Danis Robles. Okay. But again, that was, that was in the context of, of immigration, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and the part of the language, I would not be able to recite it again right now, but uh, the, uh, the part that struck out to me that I think is relevant to this is the concern about law shifting yeah. uh, too rapidly, which if a po political accountability is a virtue, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that with the fact that this is now an issue in a presidential campaign, it's not invisible to the public, then you will get instability. They will go together um, because- Can I just add to that? Yeah. I mean, but there's, you can, you can still have the political accountability rationale. I mean, I guess my argument would be that the Attorney General's referral authority, it, it, it's politically accountable in the sense that ultimately the head of the agency is the one that made the decision it's not politically accountable in the sense that it didn't go through a deliberative process yeah. that required public comment, that required the public to be aware and have input before the decision was made. And I really think when we talk about political accountability to Chevron, we're really thinking much more of the combination of a political appointee and a process mm -hmm. uh, that leads to it being more accountable long term. I mean, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And it also affects that instability argument like, if you have to go through rulemaking, it's going to take years, uh, right. hopefully, if they don't do like pre-promulgation notice and comment, right? And it's going to be slow enough that, that we could get the a public, injunction. well, that the public can get involved, right? The yeah. public can have, play a more, more prominent role than, than a referral authority where it just kind of pops up in the middle of nowhere right. sometimes, right? I mean, then you've, sometimes it's not, briefing's not even asked. They don't, there's no notice requirement, if I believe, right? That They do. You know, you I don't think I've seen them not do briefing, but there are cases where actually the they will refer a case to the the AG will refer a case to himself where the respondent is actually pro se, and then will typically ask for amicus briefing as yeah. kind of a sub in. Yeah. But it, it, you're basically right that it's a very Im imperfect way of doing that. Um, can I, can yeah, I sure, quickly weigh in? And then, because I know there's lots of other things to talk about, but the way that, I think there's a lot of different ways to, to um, fold in or account for political accountability in this structure. First of all, it could be considered at step one. You could, you could say that, you know, Congress is part of its institutional choice about whether or not courts should be deferring to agencies on ambiguous statutes. That's something that Congress should be able to decide in a statute. Uh, and then you would look at, to the statute to see if Congress delegated interpretive authority to the agency. And in the case of immigration, I think the answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. In other contexts, the answer is maybe no. So to the extent that political accountability, we, if you wanted to give that uh, doctrinal relevance and keep Chevron, I think the best way to do that might be at step one, uh, step zero. If I said step one, I, I erred. I meant at step zero of Chevron. I think Chevron that's that. correct. And so the other thing is to, I think, to Chris's point a little bit more, um, and perhaps I haven't read uh, Chris Kristen's and Aaron's paper, um, but it, it seems like to, to say that Chevron should not apply to adjudication, I'm sure there's lots of normative arguments that could be made there, but I, I would also think another solution to the problem is to revisit Chenery too, right? Because really what the problem is is that agencies are making policy um, in contexts where it's sort of outside the channel of process and politics. And so really the solution could just as well be let's force agencies to use rulemaking, assuming they have the authority to engage in rulemaking when they're making policy, right? So you don't have to attack the problem through Chevron. If you didn't want to, you could attack it through the Chenery Doctrine. And since they're both judicially created doctrines, I don't see what the value of doing one well, necessarily I mean, over the, the other. Chenery is a lot more dramatic though, right? I mean, at least in the context of getting rid of Chevron, the agency would still be the prime mover mm -hmm. through adjudication and they'd still at least get a de novo review of their policy. And I mean, I think the Chenery one is, I mean, it's super aggressive. I have to say that an agency can't even try to make a policy. And, mm -hmm. so, well, in some, yeah. yeah, so in some way then, you know, made keeping 
sort of splitting the atom of Chevron then to not apply it to um, adjudication. I, I see the value there. It's sort of a, it's a half it's a half step, yeah, right? You nudge yeah. you it, it it creates a situation where if the agency wants deference, it's a nudge towards notice and comment. Uh, and you have other things built into the Chevron framework that already do that, like go through notice and comment if you want deference. Yeah, don't I mean, do it's interesting, like, I, and I haven't wrapped my head around this entirely on, on the Chenery point. Like, it, in these types of contexts, how would you rather have law be made, right? Uh, it, like, let's put deference aside, just making the law. Do you want them to come in and make bright line rules in a rulemaking that have general applicability or kind of made divorced from facts, right? Or is it better, are we kind of common lawmakers, you know, do we like it better case by case, you know, insider trading? Do we want to try to, you know, close those loopholes as we go and not have to, I, I mean, it kind of depends on how you think law should be made better. Mm -hmm. I think the answer is going to depend right. differently on different contexts, but in the adjudication context, especially in immigration, I actually could imagine more in tax and in securities as well, that it might actually be more like effective lawmaking to do it case by case based on, you know, discrete facts and make incremental changes along the way. I don't know, I'm just going to throw it out. But Getting it, rid of Chevron well, is still like, you know. Let, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about context, actually, um, and the immigration <laughs> context. I was just reflecting on the titles of your papers. You know, Mike, your paper, Reassessing Deference in Refugee Cases, Chris, Judicial Review and Immigration Adjudication. Looking at sort of the, the, the problems you spotted in the status quo of, of judicial review of agency, of, of, of immigration actions, how much of this points towards just recalibrating in this context, and how much of it really is, you know, these are case studies that point towards not just reassessing deference in refugee cases, but reassessing deference, and not just recalibrating judicial review and immigration adjudication, but recalibrating judicial review. Because if what we're doing here is um, finding problems in the immigration context, if the solution is kind of immigration exceptionalism, to judicial review um, doctrines more broadly, well, it seems to me the court has been getting away from exceptionalism, right? They've been mm -hmm. trying to bring things together to just one set of rules for the road. Is it better to have immigration exceptionalism or is it better to use immigration as the case studies that counsel in favor of broader reforms in general? I, I actually think in this area that the court has not treated Im immigration as particularly uh, exceptional. There might be an, ar an additional argument for deference in the extra deference that the executive usually gets over immigration policy, but I think their behavior in immigration is not necessarily so exceptional. In, my, in some of my earlier papers, what I tried to argue, um, based on others' work, that you know that the che Chevron de the Chevron doctrine has a famously strange early history about how Chevron became the Chevron that we know and that it was not initially thought of as a big change on its first day and it kind of took a few years for people to suddenly realize hey, this, the big doctrine in administrative law is Chevron. Uh, I think the result of that, may, that may be a one size fit all, fits all problem um, that uh, I, I sometimes think that when the court does not apply Chevron with the same force behind it in every case. There are many different ways to explain it, particularly, I think Dave is exactly right, depending on our, our sample size, right, and to how many case studies we have. But I think sometimes also it may reflect the justices having some feeling that here, actually, Chevron feels really useful to us here, and in this case, somehow doesn't, even though the parties seem to think it was really important. Over time, if we see patterns in there, I think we might be able to find a more refined Chevron doctrine that might do the work that the court needs it to do um, without it maybe having some of the baggage. That, that is my overall theory. And I think that may be what's happening in immigration because in terms of titles, actually, part of my argument is that not all immigration cases are the same. Yeah. It's just the reason why I'm thinking about this is Gorsuch, and Justice Gorsuch in particular, seems to be returning to immigration issues as not just sort of special cases, but as the examples by which he's pushing for reform, whether it's deference, whether it's delegation, whether it's yeah. void for vagueness, right. he seems to be looking at these and saying, these aren't just problems with judicial review and immigration. These are problems with judicial review. Yes, and I, actually, I'm glad you said that because actually I think the DeMaia case about void for vagueness right. is fascinating. It, the fascinating question there, I think, is 
why was it that Gorsuch and the four liberal justices could not agree on an opinion? Because as I read them, they're not that far off from each other. Uh, I think where they might be different is that uh, the four justice plurality um, basically wanted a carve out for immigration. And Gorsuch, I can't see any place in his opinion where he objects to that for immigration, but he wants the circle to be much broader. It's like Alito and Gundy, where he said, yes. we're not going to do a special non-delegation doctrine here in this context. Can we have, I, can oh, I yeah, please, please. So, so one, I mean, my project obviously is not just about immigration. It's about any high volume agency <laughs> adjudication system. But I, I do think immigration has, I, I definitely buy into the idea, though, that immigration has shaped how judges view Chevron deference. Uh, like if you look at a study that Ken Barron and I did uh, years, a few years back, looking at like every Chevron decision in the circuit courts for a decade or so, um, the D.C. Circuit treats Chevron so much differently than the other circuits. Uh, they love it. Uh, <laughs> and I think one reason they love it is they don't deal with immigration. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the other circuits, like, the circuits that hate it the most are the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, like originally you know, pre-Trump, right? Uh, and that's like, uh, you know, interesting that a court that actually has to deal with Chevron deference in the immigration yeah. context. And I would add, it, having talked to a lot of judges or the Social Security Administration context or other contexts where they deal with adjudication systems that don't produce always the most reasonable and rational outcomes, y you have that more. And I wonder if that's kind of, you know, part of what's driving it. Gorsuch was really influenced. His view of administrative law is through, I think, a lot through immigration. Yeah, those are his key yeah. cases. Yeah. Well, we still have, we have time, and everybody's been very patient. Uh, we'll have uh, questions. Please wait for the microphone uh, to find you, uh, since this is being recorded. We'll start in the middle with David. Hi. This isn't a question so much as a reminiscence that might f feed into some of your observations. Uh, the panel has been talking about how Chevron, when it first came down, didn't seem like what, to use a Scalian term, an evulsive shift uh, in administrative law. It sort of became one, largely because you know, Scalia wasn't on the Supreme Court yet, but he, he very shortly acceded to it and became a proponent of a very hawkish view of, of Chevron. Uh, the reminiscence is that he came to give a series of talks down at Regent University when I was teaching there uh, in September of 1998. One of those talks was uh, on admin and Chevron related issues. And I remember very vividly, he said, my good friend John Stevens, he wrote Chevron, but he doesn't understand it. <laughs> you know, and Scalia, in his famous defense of Chevron, you know, in that 1989 Duke Law Journal article, Scalia puts the political accountability part of Chevron front and center. I mean, this is not doctrine, this is just his article. Mm -hmm. But even at the end of that sort of part of the article, he says, of course, if it becomes too chaotic, too much flip-flopping, then we might have problems of you know, due process, yeah. arbitrary and capricious. So even he sort of felt the, just the implicit limit that at some point if things get too chaotic, it might, it might call for a recalibration. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll go here next and then uh, also over there. Uh, hi, thank you for talking. Uh, this is a question for Professor Walker. I was wondering to the extent that the circuit court is giving direction to the agencies, how that may, um, how Vermont Yankee might put a big bridge on that because you can't impose extra procedures on the agencies like that. I know that not everything that you suggested is procedural, but how much would that be a barrier to the circuit courts guiding the agency? Oh yeah, no, I, 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 I explore that a lot in the GW piece. Um, yeah, no. It, Agents like ordering a different immigration judge, ordering a time limit, um, those things I don't think are appropriate under Vermont Yankee. Um, but in all mass adjudication contexts, courts set deadlines all the time, um, and it's just kind of acquiesced to, which is interesting, right? My bigger point, though, is not about ordering things, but suggesting and talking, right? It's the dialogue. It's not the, the, the ordering that I think is important. Now, I recognize, I mean, that's not an uncontroversial position to take. I mean, many people think judicial, from a judicial philosophy perspective that's not appropriate, right? That judges should really just decide the cases that are right before them and move on. Uh, someday I'll write my article, I don't think that's right, when you think about administrative law, in part because of the separation of powers concerns that we have with our administrative state today. I think judges need to assume a much more vocal dialogic role with agencies 
uh, because they are a co-equal branch of government and need to play their role there. Haven't written that one yet, but I need to because I think that's kind of what is motivating this larger project. Right. And the next question is Elaine. Um, hello, everybody. Um, say the best for last. You guys were fabulous, I have to say. A couple of thoughts from what Chris said. When you mentioned the D.C. Circuit, I would say they also don't have a lot of Social Security cases. So I think maybe it isn't just immigration. I think the D.C. Circuit is, you know, it's they own little They don't have much beefdom. adjudication generally. Other exactly. Other than like SEC, and SEC are not, they're, they're much higher profile. They yeah. don't have people. It's the District of Columbia. <laughs> you know, they don't have the run-of-the-mill, you know, people that need help and probably don't have a lawyer and whatever. They just have a lot of pro bono and esoteric cases. So... I, I think that may be a lot of why Chevron's become such a thing with them. Um, and I was wondering on the, on the immigration, I don't really do that, but that, didn't you say there's like 400,000 cases or something? Are, are those are there different kinds of cases? Because I was wondering, as I mentioned earlier, in the criminal case, when people are deported, they, they do go through the immigration process, but I think it's pretty perfunctory, and I don't know how many how many, what percentage of the immigration cases are, are de, you know, deportations and what percentage are asylum and et cetera. So I don't know if there's a different adjudicatory system that. for those different kinds of cases. I don't know uh, percentages, but um, the fairly, the, there are, and you are right that if someone has committed a more serious crime and done some serious time, it's quite likely that the removal process and immigration is going to be quite fast and they'll have no defenses to it. But uh, the big area of cases that I looked at where Chevron seemed to make very little difference, what's often known as the crimmigration cases, are the ones about what's known as the categorical approach and about what is a removable offense for a legal resident. And so it's probably a uh, small portion of people that are affected by it, but it's a fascinating and quite contentious area of law where the Supreme Court actually over the last 20 years has um, been fairly pro-immigrant in a sense, in that uh, by using a pretty strict categorical approach, it's provided a lot more defenses to removal at the boundary lines of uh, not in someone committed who committed homicide, but in controlled substance cases and certain types of theft cases and a number of other areas. The crime involving moral turpitude issue that was discussed earlier, it's very relevant there. That's a lot of the cases that I looked at. And the, it, that's a smaller percentage of the total? Oh, yes. I think if you look, say, in the Ninth Circuit, which I know Well, but like, I think she was asking about the immigration courts. Oh, the immigration those are courts. All, those are all, all removal, but yeah. they might be seeking relief from removal, like asylum or the like. Right. Yeah. In, in immigration court, there are two stages of, of a removal proceeding. The first stage is removability. The first thing is the government bears the burden of proof to show I'm removable. Quite often, that goes by in 30 seconds. It should be highly important, and it is highly important. Uh, um, and I often think, actually, immigrant and defense attorneys should be much more aggressive at that stage. But often, removability is conceded. Asylum, cancellation of removal, those are adjudicated at the relief stage. And when there is a trial in immigration court, it's actually usually at that second stage on relief. The person's already been found removable. Asylum is kind of like an affirmative defense to, re to removal. You could think of it that way. I would just add, if you want to, like a really fun and kind of frightening set of readings, yeah. Jennifer Coe mm -hmm. has some really fascinating articles on shadow removals. If you Google that, um, talking about all the ways that that non-citizens are removed at the border or otherwise expedited a reinstatement where you don't even get an immigration court hearing. It's done by officers that aren't administrative judges. So it's really a fascinating kind of eye-opening world for those of us that think about adjudication but don't think about immigration adjudication. Uh, you really kind of see something different. Well, as Jesse Panuccio said earlier today, it's always nice to finish on time and under budget. Let me just say a couple of things in closing. <laughs> Um, first, uh, none of these events are possible but for all of the hard work of the Gray Center's uh, indefatigable staff, the student fellows who you've seen throughout the day. Um, in this case, in the case of, of today's event, I want to especially acknowledge Andrew Kloster, our deputy director, who first conceived of the idea for the event and really did the hard work of, of finding authors and participants. Our next conference, again, is going to be November 15th on a very different topic, uh, technology, innovation, and regulation. Uh, we already will, if we haven't already announced the lineup of speakers, we will soon, and it's going to be a great event. 
For this conference, the papers are all online, both on the webpage for this particular conference, and we have a rolling list of all of the working papers that the Gray Center has helped uh, to support. So you can find them online. Um, thank you, all of you, especially you who have made it to the end, for joining us. And please join me in thanking our speakers.